I've had some long days and evenings recently ensuring that Alan stays upright. In the third episode I showed you how we did on a brief outing onto the water and it became clear that rolling, even in moderate seas, would be a challenge. Alan really needs some ballast, as low down as I can possibly find, so I'm going to identify some areas in the boat all the way from the bow to the stern where I can now lay some heavy steel. I'm not going to go with lead, um, cost, environmental concerns, all sorts of other reasons, and I was able to get hold of a fair amount of galvanised steel. So what I'm going to do is pack as much steel as I can around the areas that are basically dead volume, right down uh, in, the, in the bottom of the boat, uh, as close to the keel as I can possibly find. I also want to reinforce and mount extra ballast along the keel externally, but we'll stay inside this time around. Okay everyone, there's no way of hiding it, I've bought an even larger grinder. Whilst I could have used an angle grinder to resize and prepare a few hundred kilos of steel for slotting into Alan's lowest depths, there are other things I'd like to do before the year 2025 dawns, like argue about Brexit's five year anniversary, why people wear Covid face coverings only over their chins, and work out how on earth Nicolas Cage decides on what movies to star in. So I began catting up a chicken farm. By that, I mean that I collected up about half a tonne of spare galvanised steel bars from a chicken farm. I'm not kidding. The price of brand new bars or a solid section of mild steel was crazy, and this galve was a quarter of the price. A hire car was ideal to get it from the farm to the boatyard, and as we know, hire cars have an unlimited polo capacity, as well as being the fastest cars available. Half a tonne is only a start, of course. I've decided against fitting stability appendages like a deep keel or bilge keels as they will end up falling victim to the sheer power of sea ice, but I've earmarked external locations like around the prop shaft housing and the shallow keel itself for external ballast additions later on. The lengths were originally 5 metres and weighed 5 kilos per metre. I'm going to bundle them up so they stay put but aren't too heavy to lift for one person. I've also enlisted help. This is Dick. Say hello, Dick. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just a spare part. The, uh, the true expert of the group. He's going to play a starring role in the Sea Trials episode coming up whenever we stop having tiresome storms rolling across southeast England and has decades of local experience at sea. Although I want to make the bundles as neat as possible, we're not agonising over millimetre perfect lengths or deburring to the extremes. Whilst the main batch of bars were being finished off, I wanted to prepare the inside hull and bilge areas earmarked to store ballast. I don't want to damage the carefully painted bilges, have any rattling, or see the inevitable vibrations from Alan's engine allow the ballast to carve its way into things. It'll be bolted down as a last step, but I've also decided to bed the steel onto a robust rubber matting. The bundles wouldn't enjoy sitting in puddles of bilge water, so it's raised and with plenty of holes in. I'm designing in some gaps, through which sponges can be inserted if I want to dry the whole area out. Certainly not at all coerced in the slightest, Dick was still motoring away with the metal cutter, but I could start building up bundles of bars of the correct lengths. I'm starting off with a few turns of cheap duct tape, a shrink wrap skin, and then more robust duct tape to secure the ends. Right, let's get them in there. I'll start with the smallest zones, around the prop shaft housing. If you remember from a few episodes ago, I'm going to be reinforcing this area externally, and this will involve structural through bolting, so my solution here will be secure, but not permanent, like glassing it all in or something extravagant like that. Thinking about those ribbons that they give you in electronic gadgets that sit behind little batteries, so you can flick them out again once exhausted, I'm running very thin loops of Dyneema cord around the bundles. This means the roughly 10 kilo pieces can be slotted in very tightly, but can still be extricated when needed later down the line. We can get plenty more in there, and I think I'll do another layer next week before fitting in a securing bar. We've managed to get roughly the weight of an amply sized person in quite a small space. Every little helps. I can guarantee someone will casually complain and ask why I'm not using platinum or osmium, which are a lot denser than steel. I'm creating a patron donation page specifically for them, so they can fund such an enlightened purchase. Likewise for the person who commented with, why don't you just have a bigger, ice-rated boat built for you? In the meantime, we'll persevere with steel. The massing is more or less ready, and I've taken care to protect bolt heads and shanks, 
so that there's no damage from metal on metal friction or point loading of the weight on things liable to break. I tentatively began placing these larger bundles of ballast and since the glassing work from the original boat build was robust but let's say not too uniform in terms of shaping and finish, lumps and bumps mean I have to play it by ear as to how each bundle packs in. The battery box is going to end up being mounted on top of here but I'll be having separate anchoring for the around 200 kilos of ballast here and the 200 extra kilos of batteries on top. We don't want nearly half a ton of dead weight going on an excursion around Dallin's insides when we should be concentrating on what on earth is going on that makes dead weight want to not stay put. Right, so the final securement and the next stages of ballast further to the bow will come later. For the sea trials I'll strap down all the spare bars on the base of the fuel racking as we don't want to be down at the stern. A final source of comment section wonderment for you all. This articulating steering control mount has been identified by a couple of people as dramatically lightweight to handle any traumatic wave action on the rudder assembly. It needs to be beefed up, yet still allow rotation in two planes. I do have an idea sketched out, but let's see what you come up with. The solution is not buying another boat. You know who you are. Right, that's nearly it. Check out the community sections if you want to ask a question for an upcoming Q&A episode, and please do join the donation army for Alan, as it'll guarantee your question makes the cut. Oh, and buy shirts, caps and books, of course. They're proven to add between 11 and 12% to your daily quota of happiness. Bye.